Next on the Broadway show, a Broadway trailblazer, Elle Morgan Lee, joins us to talk about her historic Tony nomination. Plus, Tony winner Katrina Link is on the show to chat about her crucial role in the final season of Ozark. And Roxy Rock Chicago, Emma Pittman is here and she's Chicago's next leading lady. I'm Tamsin Fidel and this is the Broadway show. We are always excited to bring you another amazing episode of The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. I am a Disney usher. I'm barely scraping by. My discontentment comes in many shapes and sizes. When I wake up each morning, I tell myself to try. I tell myself that I will make no compromises. A Strange Loop is this year's most nominated show at the Tony Awards, with 11 nods, including Best Musical, and is also historic for a different reason. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. L. Morgan Lee is making history as the first transgender performer ever nominated for a Tony Award. We met up at the Civilian Hotel to talk all about her incredible journey to Broadway. You have to tell me, what is it like to be a Tony nominee? What is life like suddenly? Your life is, is changing, I feel, week to week right now. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know what it's like yet because I'm still in disbelief. Days later, I'm still trying to figure out, like someone the other day was like, um, Tony nominee, Elle Morgan Lee. And I was like, looking around, <laughs> like, wait, who are you talking about? Not, not me. Yeah, I, I, I am still trying to wrap myself around even being a black trans woman on mm -hmm. Broadway in yeah. a principal role. Um, so to then add having the work recognized by like, you know, the people that you look up to and that you've been sort of, in some ways, like artistically idolizing over the years. Yeah. To have it be recognized amongst those people is like, it's mind blowing. Let me let me just sort of uh, remind you what you've been through. You make your Broadway debut in a show that you love, that you've been with for many years, especially and over the pandemic, sort of waiting for this moment. You get fantastic reviews. You get a Tony nomination. You break a barrier as the first trans performer to get nominated. It's it's a lot, and I just wonder. You still have to just focus on doing the show and doing your job. Yes, yes. And suddenly your job becomes scarier to do because you you see people going, oh, it's like I'm so used to being able to just to just do my do job, like sort of under the radar almost. And the minute those nominations come out, it becomes like, oh, no, no, no. Everyone's watching you now. Everyone's looking at you. Yeah. You're aware a lot more of the responsibility mm -hmm. of it all. Now I'm like, oh, God, I have to live up to the nomination. <laughs> like, so it's, it's it suddenly becomes a like, I want to just do my job and keep my feet on the floor. Yeah. If I can keep my feet on the floor, then I'm in a good place. So we have to talk about your family over um, at Strange Loop. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're. it's a tight group. What is it like backstage, sort of, I mean, the most Tony nominations of the year, a black queer cast, it, it just feels like, it, again, everything does have extra significance it, for, for the, it, it's a fantastic show or it's a fantastic show and it means more because of all these extra levels mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for so many of us. No, it's it's incredible. Well, for, number one, we're a family. Like, so all of the nuances that come with a family are all present. We have dysfunctions, sure. we have, there's always <laughs> someone that's a little more kooky than others. There's always, <laughs> but I, I literally love them so much and I feel like they see me so clearly and like love me and they protect me and I feel like they root for me and I root for every one of them in that same way. They are they are my hearts in so many ways. Um, it, it can be complicated being the only girl in the bunch, but as long as there's balance, like our daytime away from the theater, then I'm good. <laughs> so in, in A Strange Loop, you are thought one, yes. and the lead character Usher has the thoughts, and, and it's it's a really fun device in the show. If, if we had a musical version of your thoughts right now, oh. what would that look like? Oh God, oh my gosh, my thoughts would be really tormenting actually. They'd be, you have to live up to something thought. Um, they would be, making sure that you look at the, what is, what is your presentation to the world thought. Yeah. There, there is also that thought that's like the thought one for me. Cause thought, I, I am the one thought that actually does put some sort of love into Usher and care into Usher yes. and is like, you know, you are worth something and like don't take life for granted. I think I would also have one of those thoughts that's like, you're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that for me, that's the, the hope thought is maybe the most strong. Mm. And that's the one that I think in so many ways sort of dulls the other ones around me. It's like, you know what, you might be going through all kinds of craziness today. You might be having all these things, but you know what? 
you're gonna be okay because you've made it this far. Tell me a little bit more about uh, your childhood and Bowie, Maryland, right outside of DC, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grew up in areas like surrounding that. So it was like, Bowie is like the main spot for sure. me. It's like, like standard, standard Maryland fair, like sort of suburban, <laughs> like middle class. Like, yeah, what about theater and performing? In terms of theater? How um, did that start? Yeah, I, well, I started in nursery school. Wow. In nursery school, we did a, like a talent show situation. I always had to be like three or four. Wow. My teachers had me do Karma Chameleon by Boy Love George. It. Love it, So my mom came to the show and was like, why is my child in makeup and all this stuff? I think it's one of those situations where like the world sort of in some ways sees you before you see you. In my head, I always saw I'm a little obsessed with your singing voice. I mean, oh. I, when did you discover your voice? I have been singing, my mom said, ever since I was a little kid in the, like in my little high chair. So I had been singing since I could speak, wow. basically. You shared a photo recently. I think you said you were cleaning up your apartment. You found some old photos of you at age 19. Uh -huh. And you said it was the first time, you said the first mm -hmm. time, I think it was probably the first time you saw yourself. Can you tell me about that young woman in those photos? Ooh. So there was a production of La Caja Fall mm -hmm. that was happening in Philadelphia at the Walnut Street Theater. And people were like, you should audition for this. You should be seen for this. And I was like, well, if I'm gonna do that, that means I need to probably like dress a certain way and kind of put myself together. I had just had Halloween and it was the first time for Halloween I allowed myself to just try something new. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, you're gonna be a girl for Halloween and just sort of, you know, put these clothes on and and see how it feels. Right. And like, <laughs> oh Jesus. The minute I did, um, I felt like a jolt of energy that I had never felt before. Mm. But I suddenly felt like strong and like free in so many ways. So the rest of my time at school, I kept, um, the rest of my time in school, I kept um, trying to find excuses to, to dress this way. And so in my head, it was always like, I can't possibly be trans because the narrative, the only narrative that we see is one where you hate your skin pretty much. Um, and so I was like, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but I know that like things, things never felt like they added up. And like those moments were ones where they did. It's like when I told the truth, all of a sudden doors started to open, mm. which I think is like such a testament to truth transcends. Mm. And like people, people are able to find themselves in your truth as well. In terms of theater and roles, like all of a sudden I'm getting asked to look at like things I dreamed about for years, which is which is really beautiful. I love that, thank you for sharing that. And, and I love that you're so open with your story in a community that hasn't had much representation. And we all, you know, we always say representation is so powerful yeah. for everyone. And you are now able to be that person. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be that person for many people in the audience at the Lyceum Theater and beyond. Mm -hmm. and that must feel, it, there must be something extremely rich about that. It took me a while to find me. I want it to be easier for others. Mm. And I think you have to you have to see yourself sometimes in order for that to happen. And so I think it's important in some ways for I don't think it's important for everyone to do that, but if you if you feel the pull, if you feel the tug to to be vocal and to be willing to have the conversations that might feel sort of tedious for other people, yeah. then like listen to that call and have those conversations because somebody's going to hear you. And so for me, it's just, it's what's most important is that like some kid that was me hears me and goes, because she did it, I can. Katrina Link is a Tony Award winner and star of Company, one of Broadway's funniest musicals. But in addition to seeing her on the New York City stage, you can also catch her in one of Netflix's most popular shows. I caught up with Katrina to talk about the return of Broadway and her pivotal role in the hit TV series, Ozark. Your greatest threat will always come from the inside, Marty. Never forget that. 
I almost jumped out of my bed when I saw you on my favorite show ever. So I was very, very excited as I was watching Ozart. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's also my favorite show. I was uh, obsessed, obsessed. Were you watching it before and how did all yes. that come about? I was a rabid fan and um, during the apocalypse there I got a, you know a, a Zoom audition for their final season and I was like what? Uh, uh, what? So, you know, it was this weird thing where we're on Zoom auditioning and then I got a call back and I was like what is happening? And that was also on Zoom and then I was on some road trip somewhere and I got the call from my um, from my manager that I booked it. And I was like, what? What a different role too for you, right? I mean, that's just like, I feel like Broadway is such a sweet talent and stage. <laughs> and then this, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> opioids. <laughs> <laughs> opioids, yeah. And Claire's like, you know, she's like everybody on that show is just is doing, like they believe they're doing the best they can in the situations that they're in. So she's really, she's really trying. Phone rings, door chimes, in comes company. Let's talk about the revival of company because that is exciting. And uh, that show is just, I don't know, it's just, it gets, it gets so many smiles, you know, it, it really does. It's so thrilling to be back after having taken the, taken the hiatus for two years that we all, you know, that everybody did. So it's, it's definitely a, a, a pinching yourself moment to get to do this show and with this incredible cast and with Patti Lapone, who is just amazing and just there 200% every night and so authentic and still exploring and like examining the scenes and the songs and the entire cast is just consummate professionals and so funny, so funny. And the, sh the show itself is really, you know, embracing the humor that's in the script and the music. So it's really, it's really a lot of fun to do. Really a lot of fun. For people that have not seen Company, what should they know about it and, and why should they go see it? If they need a laugh, it's a great thing to do. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it takes place in Manhattan now. So it's, um, it's, you know, about this mm, successful bachelorette who's having a milestone birthday and kind of gets pushed into the surprise party held by her married friends. Um, so it kind of, it's an exploration of what it's like to live in Manhattan, what it's like to be single, what it's like to be in a relationship, um, commitment, fear of commitment, the need for human connection, how do we get it? And um, it just kind of celebrates all the things about what it is to be alive now. I also think it's very pivotal after a pandemic because the need for human connection, we didn't even realize we needed it, wanted it, cared about it. People are really appreciative of it in a different way. Definitely. And we, we felt that for sure at our first preview that, I mean, we, we thought it would be exciting, you know, for us and maybe the audience, but it was just that, that feeling of celebration from the audience of like, yay, we're all here and we're sharing this story together in this space together and we're connecting with the audience and with our fellow actors. It was really, um, a really extraordinary moment of realizing that that need for connection and celebrating that connection. There's still a lot more to talk about on this edition of The Broadway Show. Coming up, we'll talk to one of Broadway's incredible performers about why he's just got to dance. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show, and we'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of The Broadway Show. So glad you're here. Emma Pittman is Broadway's next leading lady, making her Broadway debut as Roxy Hart in Chicago in a matter of days. Let's check back in with Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. After winning Broadway.com's The Search for Roxy, Emma Pittman is ready to make her eagerly anticipated debut in Chicago on Broadway. We met up at the Skylark to talk all about her journey to the stage. Broadway.com hosted the search for Roxy. You submitted a video, became a semifinalist, became a finalist, auditioned in front of a bunch of fancy people, got the role of Roxy Hart, and then the pandemic happened. So we basically been on pause, waiting for this moment, but now the moment is here. The moment is finally here, yeah. It, I feel like the, the pandemic came at such a crazy time in so many people's lives, but everybody was so worried about me and confused and at that point, I was just like, I just want everyone to be safe. I just want everyone to feel like they know what's going on in their world and we're all taking care of one another. But then when Broadway started opening up again, it was like, ooh, okay, things are in motion, things are happening, what's the next step? So it's finally here, I can't believe it. So you did this whole process while cameras were rolling. Mm -hmm. 
And your final audition was in front of the late Ann Ranking, who we've now lost, yeah. and B.B. Newworth and Bianca Marroquin. What was it like watching Ann Ranking call you a triple threat? It's one of those things that as a theater person, when you think about your your dream inspirations, you don't even dream of having those kind of conversations. So yeah. it's so otherworldly to actually have ha heard her said it in real life, and then for it to be on tape forever and ever and something I can cherish and have is unbelievable. So yeah, what, what do you like about Roxy? I mean, this is a great role. This is a fantastic role. Fabulous role. It's like just one of those roles that's like iconic. Anyone can play it because it's so versatile. When we were doing the search, Kate and Khalifa and I were always talking fellow about- Fellow finalists. Yes, fellow fantastic. finalists. Yes. We were talking about how the thing that makes Roxy amazing is that you make it yours. Yeah. It's never about who's gonna be the best one. It's what's your Roxy have to offer? What's making her different from other people? And for me, it's gonna be comedy, I'm telling you. I think Roxy is so silly. I think she's so naive and funny and like she loves vaudeville and there's so much silly laughter and jokes in vaudeville that I'm so excited to play with. Is there anything scary about this, stepping into Chicago on Broadway? I think what's scary is the unknown, but the unknown can, you can look at the unknown with a lot of fear, or you you can look at it like a first time learner. That's like, okay, instead of being afraid of it, which is very easy, you could definitely be afraid of stepping into a big role. I'm gonna just own it because I'm here for a reason. The $10 founding father still holds Broadway's hottest ticket, and Hamilton features some truly spectacular physical performances. We met up with one of the show's great performers at Open Jar Studios to find out why he's just got to dance. My name is Preston Mui. I am in Hamilton, and I play George Eager in the ensemble. I first started dancing when I was 10 years old. I did my first musical, which was Oliver and I became obsessed with the stage. At 10 years old, I decided to start training for my Broadway debut. <laughs> I took a dance class out of a home garage from my first dance teacher <laughs> at Stardance Studio I am in San Francisco, California, where I just studied tap and jazz, and then eventually went to an arts high school. There I studied modern, contemporary, African ballet. And then um, I moved to LA, training in hip hop and jazz funk, and really learning the Hollywood ropes. When I first found out I was joining the Broadway company of Hamilton, I was choreographing a show in Las Vegas, and I actually wasn't expecting to come back to my journey as a performer. After 20 years of my career in Los Angeles, the thought of coming back to the stage and finally fulfilling my Broadway dream this late in my journey was so mind-blowing to me. The night of my Broadway debut, I remember messing up so much. Learning Hamilton is a huge undertaking. It's three hours long. You're learning it by yourself in a dance studio. And there's so much information you have to retain. And so the night of my debut, it was like I had to let all of that go and just perform whatever was gonna happen with my body and my voice. <laughs> and so, yes, mistakes were made, but it was so fun and everyone on stage is so supportive. They just helped move me along. It was just such an amazing experience. Dancing for audiences right now in Hamilton, especially after this pandemic, it has been cathartic for myself, but Knowing that I can bring a little bit of joy to people for a few hours in a night, it's, it's better than what it does for me. It's more that I get to do something for other people while also doing something I love. If my younger self knew that I was where I am now, that little chubby Asian kid with a bowl cut would be freaking so excited. <laughs> my younger self would just be really happy to know that all the hard work was worth it. What I'm most proud of isn't one job in particular or one person that I've ever worked for. It's mostly that I was able to forge a way into this industry and to maintain a career 
and to create a livelihood for myself in an industry that doesn't have a lot of representation for people like me. So I feel most proud that I was able to stand on my own two legs and really just work and create a lane for myself and for others coming after me. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.